Welcome to the show, Matthew Arid, the one and only legendary Matthew Arid. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Always, always a pleasure to be with you. We haven't been talking for a while, uh, dude. Uh, I've been uh, following you for some quite some time and reading some of your articles. Even you know, joining your new Telegram group, it's amazing stuff you post. I mean, not only from from yourself, but what I find really, you have a very holistic approach to things, to uh, you know, to the reality we are surrounded with. And um, what I also love, you know, your articles, uh, whether you write it yourself or your wife or your, uh, you know, the corporation partners, uh, like the one piece that you published today, it wasn't by you, but it was, uh, what is it called? Uh, CanadianPatriot.org. Um, so by the way, Matthew Arred is one of the most leading investigative journalists, uh, author, historians, if I may call you. Um, yeah. and. Uh, the article what i really loved is china's high-speed trains north america where are you pretty good piece it was written by larry, larry Romanov. Romanov. Yeah. yes so this is why i mentioned that because i want to talk to you about the broader understanding implications of what kind of technologies have been suppressed what what is possible what's the solution you know what are the answers you know because i mean you have a such an in-depth <laughs> knowledge and comprehension you can connect the dots you can give people even the layman on the street the woman and woman and man on the street uh, the bigger picture but let's let's just start off because it's so you know critical right now uh, this whole because i i feel like we're on the verge of a you know of a uh, on a on the peak of a clown theater <laughs> when it comes to this whole uh you know russia china us anglo-american um complex uh nato uh yeah. complexity going on can you give like a maybe sh pretty short like overview comprehensive like overview what's going on uh yeah. i heard that even russia has been like um taking control over 20 percent of the of the of the, i don't know what to call them their territories can you just maybe expand a little bit well i you you have a a dying system on the one side um which is a system that up until a few years ago was relatively unchallenged. It was sort of the only game in town. And uh, this game was created as a, as a rigged game, you know, uh, that no one, no one participating by the rules that we were told to play by could have possibly have won. It's like going into the casino and uh, expecting to beat the, uh, beat the house. You know, it, it really doesn't happen that way. It's not wired to work that way. Um, and the little gains you think you might be getting are actually undoing you in the future. And that was what globalization was wired to be. Um, the operating system was established really in a full-throated way with uh, Henry Kissinger's work alongside uh, George Shultz, his uh, colleague in, the, Reagan, in the, the Nixon administration, who together worked very closely um, with a, a network that came to be the basis of what was known as the Trilateral Commission um, that fully came in with David Rockefeller's Big New Brzezinski under uh, Ford and Carter, especially Carter. And what was done was the US dollar, which was the basis of global exchange rates. You know, all anybody wanting to settle any type of balance of payments or any type of, you know, <laughs> international financial activity had to have reserves of US dollars. And that had been the way since it, that it had been since 1945. Um, the US dollar was removed from the gold reserve system. And with that, a new logic was, was brought in um, this is the rigged game I was telling you about. Um, that new logic was we no longer have to have an industrial um, economy anymore. Capitalism is now going to become post-industrial. That was a fraud. That right there, right there, <laughs> if you had um, an inkling of morality available in a position of, uh, in people who had positions of leadership, they would have immediately have corrected that that lie right away because you cannot have capitalism if you're post-industrial, if you're not productive, it just means that you, where you get value from, where you extract value and what associates value with the dollars in circulation in your system is going to be tied to either, well, what are unproductive ways of making value? You could speculate, you could gamble, which is what increasingly happened as you know, the, the dollar was floated onto the floating exchange rates, which made it not tied to any type of measurable uh, variable on industrial indices, so the, the US dollar or any dollar increase, increasingly with that became tied to whatever people want to bid on a, on a, the futures or spot markets on what they think oil is going to be because now, you know, 
the, the petrodollar is going to be created in 1973. So increasingly, it's just whatever the, the animal spirits of the market's demand is what the value becomes. Well, what if the animal spirits are insane, right? What if people lose a sense that, you know, they, they should have running water? They forget that and they, they don't value. What if they just value heroin over reliable sewage systems and running water? Well, the animal spirits go nuts, right? Um, and that's what increasingly happened as the system was deregulated. And with that deregulation, you saw a stripping of national power. Nation states were no longer in a position to, to play any role in economic activity. And increasingly, who did play the role was supranational financiers, private central banking institutions, private corporations, which got more bigger and bigger, right? As they were unbounded and they were allowed to have mergers and acquisitions, that they would normally have never gotten away with in previous decades. They could, everything became part of the profit is good, uh, you know, 1980s me generation period where this really got consolidated. And during that time, the backbone of Western capitalism, the, the small and medium enterprises, the mom and, shop, mom and pop shops, the, the agro industrial, smaller and medium, you know, businesses, which is where all of the innovation was happening. All of, all of the new discoveries, the new the new ideas uh, were, were primarily being driven by um, the lifeblood of, of you know the Western economy. This was all being crushed. They were people who were not multinational corporations couldn't pay the twenty percent interest rates that Paul Volcker Trilateral Commission jacked up as part of his controlled disintegration of the world economy from nineteen seventy nine to eighty two. Um, they couldn't pay that. So, Foreign countries got more indebted, right? During during the, that period, that same period, it wasn't just local businesses and, and farmers that were wiped out, but also look at the rate of debt slavery over Africa, South America, um, Asia. All of these countries all of a sudden had to, you know, pay twenty percent on their on their their debt obligations. They couldn't do that. That that sunk them ever ever more deeply. Um, so you had. A game where everybody who played was going to lose. And um, one other component of this involved a master slave society. It wasn't called slavery anymore. You know, it, it was wrapped under a new set of words. Um, but the logic was the same. It was economic in, in slavery. But, you know, we were told, oh, are, aren't you at least happy if, if somebody was bothered by this sweatshop, cheap labor markets of Indonesian children working 14 hours a day, you know, to make cheap baseballs for Walmarts, you know, we, people who might've had a problem were, were told, oh, but isn't it better that they earn 25 cents a day working 14 hours, um, than getting nothing? Would you rather that they get nothing? You, aren't you heartless? And these types of stupid, stupid, lame arguments somehow were accepted, and we just got more addicted to cheap labor. And for the labor to stay cheap, the people had to stay undeveloped, right? And because as soon as you develop a people, if, if let's say Indonesia or China or Mexico, which were utilizing for their cheap labor in the 1980s and 90s, what if they start developing their, their, their infrastructure? What if they start developing mass education? These kids will all of a sudden spend a lot more time in school, right? The more advanced the society is, the more time you can have or you should have to expand your mind in higher education, right? So all of a sudden you'd only enter the labor force when you're maybe 24, 25, 26. That's a lot of lost cheap labor. And when you enter the labor force, you're going to have a longer life expectancy, right? A longer quality of life, uh, higher technological skills. That means your labor is going to be more expensive. It means you, you cannot still make those cheap dollar store baseballs. Um, it means that you're going to have higher paid labor. And that was, that's been the case going back to the American revolution. There was a fight over whether America was going to be a cheap labor market, um, you know, producing cash crop, cash crops, um, and cotton for the, uh, the British textile manufacturers, um, remaining relatively underdeveloped, which is what it was after the, the revolution and also in debt, unpayable debts, or whether it was going to have protectionism, um, an industrial developed workforce that had a longer life expectancy, more powers of productivity, more cognitive power. That was, that was a fight. And um, 
that's the fight that that happened over the course of the past 50 years again but now instead of it being the u.s the u.s has been keep in mind during this time jfk has died bobby kennedy has died martin luther king malcolm x um earlier franklin roosevelt dies probably assassinated as do many of his his better anti-imperial allies um there have been many many american presidents who were killed resulting in a situation where the u.s became taken over kind of like you know star star trek right you have the borg which take over hosts that's sort of what happened with the u.s as a body being infiltrated by this um id this deep state which increasingly took control over the dead bodies of these patriots and had it serve the interest not of the U.S. or the people because the people were destroyed, the U.S. government became less secure, right? The world became more unstable. So nobody really benefited as far as people or the nation it, the, who benefited from this whole 50-year, 60-year process um, of the rigged game were those same agencies that have always wanted to restore a new feudalism to undo not just the american revolution and not just destroy um the usa but to undo the renaissance that that preceded the american revolution they wanted to undo that entire awakening of that something very special that had happened within human culture in the 15th century that 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 for the first time saw human beings as being sacred and all of us being made in the image of god and that would be the basis upon which that concept that nation national laws would be crafted that would be considered viable and legitimate in opposition to unjust laws that recognize human beings as having no sacredness and no sacredness to life. So this question of will money serve and will the laws that ser that for, that shape the behavior of profit, of money, of national priorities, would that be enshrined in the idea of, of life and mind as being sacred? Or would it be something to enslave us based on the idea that we're born, some are born slaves, some are born masters, and money be, thus being kind of like a hammer, just another tool to kill your neighbor instead of uh, building a house. And so this is the, the thing that we're now dealing with is that that rigged game is now coming to its conclusion. The system is melting down, but unlike the case maybe a decade ago or what is it today? It's 2022. Yeah, 20, 2012, 10 years ago. It was relatively unchallenged, as I said at the, big, at the beginning. There was one game run by the transatlantic rules-based international order, the New World Order, <laughs> New World Orderistas, you could call them, um, that wanted to utilize the, uh, the, the controlled demolition of the world system as an excuse to create shock therapy, traumatize the people, kind of like what happened in Weimar 1923, or it was done in, uh, in uh, Russia in the 1990s, but do it on a global level. And, you know, in Weimar, it was, it was hyperinflation, and it was done partially to destroy the currency, but partially to psycho-spiritually destroy the, the, the people who still had some sense of freedom that had to be crushed in order to radicalize the people, create a climate that would be more conducive to growing fascism, which the pre-1923 German population never would have accepted fascist ideology or eugenics, the, you know, the science of racial purification. Right, that, that started like, what, uh, 1900s? I mean, even in, uh, when did it start and where did it start? In United States, eugenics, or was it also like Scandinavian country? I mean, everywhere. Uh, but it wasn't like, uh, I mean, what's important, I think, for people to understand eugenics, or eugenics agenda, or uh, what was that name? Um, Mrs. Sanger? <laughs> Margaret Sanger, yeah. Yeah, who, who I think she was quoted some, some, sometime, I read a quote of her, like, we should never let the Negro population, like uh, you know, the African American population, never know that you know we are we are pursuing this agenda, and and it was sort of contrasted with a with a with a with a quote by Obama, <laughs> uh, I don't know, some some years ago, where he where she where he said, uh, well, which I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, we should somehow look up to. Uh, Mrs. Sanger. I, I'm not sure what the context was, but even just mentioning or or uh, referencing Mrs. Sanger. I, I don't even know her first name. 
Mar- um, Mar- Margaret. Singer. Exactly. I mean, it's just so grotesque. And, and uh, so th- that's what I was just going to say is that the eugenics program uh, and that's what you all, all you know, always reiterate it and, and explain in your articles and your interviews. It didn't start in, in Nazi Germany. <laughs> that's that's yeah, a yeah. point. Yeah. No, yeah. No, exactly. And um, yeah, that's horrifying. And and it is a rich, disgusting irony that you have Obama saying this. Um, and um, yeah, the, so it didn't start in Nazi Germany. No, in fact, Nazi Germany, when they began their their eugenics policies of, you know, sterilizing the unfit, who and who deems what the unfit is, right? Right there. That's, that's already a problem. Who, who's going to judge who's the unfit? So they had certain metrics that they created premised around statistical analysis of people's family lineage that they could forecast into the future. They, they used probability theory to justify um, sterilizing people who had low IQs, criminal records, other things. And, uh, and that was done modeled on legislation that had already been applied vigorously in the United States, where 30 states had already passed sterilization laws based on these so-called scientific principles of uh, racial purification or and that's the human race as a whole it, so though, though it was racially targeted as well there's you know it didn't matter if you were white or black uh in the sense that you you would be um if you were um if you were poor you would face equal uh, subjugation to the eugenics policies but obviously uh-huh. not not all un- unfavored poor people are are equal and and certainly as Margaret Sanger pointed out, the darker skinned races were less favorable and uh, and that was done. That was done quite a bit also to Native Americans, um, including those in Canada. I mean, where where people like Sanger, all these eugenics people, you know, around. I mean, were they really convinced that what people with darker skin, whatever, or our specific lineage or uh, racial, ethnical, I mean, are less intelligent or, or, should, or is somehow detrimental to, to the human race? Well, what's the philosophy behind that? Just, just maybe it's, briefly. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's blatant tribal racism. Um, it's, it's like people of the, the superior tribe getting a little bit too drunk off their own egos and sense of superiority and then looking for some scientific reasoning why they're superior. That's really what it comes down to. And it might have certain veneers of uh, virtue that they use, they clothe their argumentation around to make it seem more attractive, you know, putting a bit of honey around the poison. But it really is this slimy, ugly thing, um, which which just is an imperial ideology. And, and Margaret Sanger, for those who don't know, she is the founder of, of Planned Parenthood, um, a great, uh, tr- you know, celebrity uh, figure who's often promoted as being a great um, beacon, a, he- a heroine, of the women's rights, women's liberation. Now, and, and, and the father of Bill Gates, uh, I think it's important to mention, right? Was the director, what do you call it, president of Planned yeah, Parenthood? Of Planned, yeah, he ran, he managed Planned Parenthood, yeah. Bill Gates Sr., for a number of years. A very close ally with David Rockefeller, as I mentioned, who worked with Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew New to uh, found the Trilateral Commission that conducted this financial coup in the early 70s. Um, David Rockefeller was, again, a close Gates family associate. And uh, again, like this, this was done specifically as a way to create a hierarchical caste system under a scientifically managed society. That, that was really the objective. And nobody would ever, or at least it was rare to hear anyone say it that way that I just said it, because if they did, no one would drink that poison. So they, of course, wrap it in... Uh, what appears to be scientific lingo mumbo jumbo, but it really was never that. And um, and it was not even American. So even though it was American eugenics laws that Hitler modeled his program around, it was actually British. So Britain, as I mentioned, had fifth column deep state operations within the United States that had been there and, and that they grew them um, since the American Revolution, really. They, there's, there were factions that never left. You had stay behinds. And uh, groups coming out of the late late 19th century, certain industrialists were absorbed into this British-run deep state. Um, among those were figures like Andrew Carnegie. Um, the Rockefeller um, family was was originally start, they started out as as American industrialists, you know, train barons and steel barons, and and um, and they found themselves rewarded 
by uh, forces that existed on the other side of the ocean and had certain tasks assigned to them to carry out to undermine the nationalist traditions of the United States, which were always antithetical to the system of empire since the days of, of you know, Washington, uh, John Quincy Adams, Hamilton, Ben Franklin, uh, Lincoln, you, you always had this constitutional uh, principle that was something which British grand strategists understood if it were not only successfully made dominant in the USA, it would also spread to other countries, as was the case in Russia, which was adopting the protective tariff American system policies for internal development state-backed national credit for the development of the Trans-Siberian Railway. You know, I, I think you and I have talked about this in the past, but we saw this blossom in China, in, in Japan, after the Meiji Restoration, there was a fight, whether it would go pro-American or pro-British, it ended up going pro-British um, under, a, a, you know, an Anglo-Japanese uh, treaty that turned, that basically inflamed the worst elements of the samurai imperial ideal ideology of Japan and, and turn them into a battering ram against Russia um, and other countries, as we saw in, in the 20th century. France, South America, Latin America, I mean, so many countries were adopting this in the 19th century, and this had to be destroyed. Because if this were successfully not, if this were not destroyed, you and you had a world of cooperating sovereign nation state actualizing their full potentials of their citizenry as participants in their government, as well as in humanity, as part, you know, partaking in a non-zero sum mode of being, right? Creating new discoveries, transmitting those discoveries into new technologies. If that were the case, permitted to thrive, then empire could not exist with all of its insidious um, techniques of divide to conquer, creating false famines, false wars, unnecessary scarcity that they need to do as a matter of empire that they've been doing for thousands of years to keep the slaves fighting each other and depopulated, living in smaller cages. Um, so this is something which eugenics arose as a way to modify or extend certain um, new biological sciences that had been promoted by the British Empire in the 18th, late 50s, 60s, under the form of Charles Darwin and um, what was known as, uh, you know, the Darwinian theory of natural selection as a as a way to find the mechanism because it's not like evolution isn't happening it's it's the question of what was the mechanism that would explain how species change that was the fight and today see people they lose the nuance they think oh you have to be a darwinian natural selectionist or a radical creationist who believes everything literally in the bible you have to pick one of the two camps mm -hmm. it's like okay. wait a minute mm -hmm. no i don't <laughs> that's not the case at all that's a false dichotomy if you actually look at it, there was a big robust fight in the 19th century as people were discovering fossils. They were starting to discover that there were these changes going back in geological time that had to be explained. We didn't see that things were just slowly changing gradually. We found instead, the more you dug, that uh, the idea of gradualism was not the case. Evidence showed creative leaps, that yeah. systems would disappear, new systems would come into being. So again, what was the mechanism allowing for this? And also there was greater complexity, right? The new system that had mammals had a greater amount of robust complexity in the ecosystem and, and all of the relationships than the previous system did that was more dominated by dinosaurs and the, the previous system to, to that was even less complex. So there was like a seeming evidence of directionality, mm -hmm. of creative orientation. Um, and so Darwin was one of many different uh, people kicking in a theory of what, what that mechanism was. Yet the other ones were not told about today. James Dwight Dana, Lamarck, uh, Cuvier, uh, my God, uh, Carol Ernst von Baer, who did work on more uh, morphogenic fields, early morphogenic fields back in the uh, 19th century. These were all contemporaries uh -huh. of Darwin. And they were, they were coming out with their own explanations, which when you look at it today, they're very, some of them are very solid arguments that in that, but what was Darwin doing? And this gets at, at eugenics. Okay. I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. And, and eugenics is the heart of transhumanism. So in order to understand transhumanism and when, what is it that the, what is the inner religion of the, those freaks that did the coup d'etat that created the false rigged game in 1971 in order to create 
a controlled demolition to create shock therapy, to have people accept something that they would never accept as far as a global world government run by a, a managerial uh, class above, you know, ab above the, uh, the masses that would then depopulate the world or have us willingly depopulate ourselves and dumb us down willingly. There's a certain religious like uh, uh, belief structure, which has a direct continuity, right? Going back, like I said, to the age of eugenics and the age of what I'm talking about now with the fight over Darwinianism, because eugenics was applying the Darwinian solution to human organization because Darwin's theory was was applied specifically to biology not really dealing with so much human humanity and so Thomas Huxley known as Darwin's bulldog the the grandfather of Aldous and Julian uh who not quite uh coincidentally especially Julian was the founder of transhumanism that's the where the word itself came from was julian huxley 1954 the, the grandson right they were he was also the president of the british eugenics society which also was really malthusian i'm sorry to interrupt you is that also oh, yeah. part of the or is it connected to malthusian agenda yes it is okay, okay. but well, let's put that one aside for the moment because there is a direct continuity it's true from malthus to darwin to galton <laughs> to the transhumanists that that is there let's put that aside for the moment um, so, <clears throat> or you know, let's bring it in. Let's, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll bring that in. Okay. Cause in, in Darwin's system, which, which said, okay, the mechanism is random mutations on the small. We're going to assume that, that there's these things, the, these little mutations going on in the living organisms all the time, randomly, like, like constant rolling of the dice. Again, the gambling, uh, allegory is, is not a coincidence. It's kind of like always happening very fast. And occasionally, you, the dice will just roll sixes like a million times in a row. And what will happen was you'll, that that fortunate luck of the, the roll will result in a bigger claw for that species. And that bigger claw will allow that species to then beat out all of the weaker competing competitors in its, uh, you know, genus or whatever, as they then die away, giving by the, that bigger claw's ability that to, to, you know, have more food, more sex, you know, in a world of, of diminishing returns. Because again, Darwin's system was a world that, that assumed British economic principles of diminishing returns, that it was a closed system. And because it's closed, there's a, the sum is, is its parts, right? The, the whole is the sum of its parts. And thus, every time you have more activity, there is a diminishing amount of resources to be distributed to the competitors. So this is the Darwinian idea. And that scarcity, that tension creates an impetus for more of the rolling of the dice resulting in bigger attributes, faster feet, whatever, you know, bigger peacock feathers or that more, more colorful, whatever. So the, the whole thing is rooted into a sex drive and a survival drive for more pleasure to, and to spread the seed there. And, and with that comes certain other assumptions like gradualism. So in the Darwinian view, there's no, there's no room for creative leaps. It's, it's all assumed that it's, everything is a slow, gradual modification over time. Now, the problem was evidence didn't show us that. We never see really those small, gradual changes. We see, that, like I said, leaps. We also don't see it as random. We see it as oriented towards um, not just increased complexity, but increased powers of action, increased free energy in the system. So, you know, going from unicellular life 500 million years ago, when we saw only evidence of single-celled, boring uh, it was a very boring earth, not very much cycling of, um, of atoms going from the, the atmosphere, from the, the, the what's called the, the lithosphere, the non-living sphere. Now I'm using the terminology here of, of, a, of a Russian biogeochemist named Vladimir Vernatsky. You have, you know, it, everyone just, who just thinks for two seconds and just looks at how are atoms and molecules organized in nature. They're either organized by life, by non-life, or by mind, right? Everything around us right now is mind, <laughs> like everything, including like my shirt, right? The atoms, the carbon in my shirt, it, you know, the hydrocarbons in my in the in the in, in my microphone, in my cup, you know, everything here is shaped by ideas and thoughts. These are like fossils of of ideas that go back. You know, we don't know the names for most of the people who made the discoveries, but so we live in what's called as Vernadsky worded, termed it, the newosphere, the, the noetic sphere, where atoms are shaped by the mind, thoughts. 
then you have the the living sphere right so like my plants um also have carbon but it's different from the carbon in a rock right the, the behavior of the carbon is animated in the case of my plant by life or in the case of my body by life in the case of the rock no it's more boring so in the case of early life in the precambrian it was, you had very little of those single-celled organisms absorbing uh, material from the outside expelling it from you know processing it from within themselves and then expelling it you know back into the into the biosphere it, it was very low level activity now today, 500 million years ago, we see that it's a very high level of activity, right? There's a constant inhaling and expelling, right? In, in goes the, the oxygen, out goes the carbon dioxide. That, that's my process. That's our relationship with plant life. That, and this came about by new in, creative innovations. Which is good. CO2 is good. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> CO2 is so good. And it was produced by the sun, you know? Like it's, people say, you know, uh, solar, solar panels are so good. And it's like, not really. Compare the, the effectiveness of transforming, you know, solar power light into and heat into work. Compare it to a leaf and chlorophyll. The chlorophyll molecule is magnitudes more effective than a, a, a photovoltaic cell could ever be. Like plants do it well. So we, we have this, this coherence, right, in, 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 the, in the biosphere that we're a part of. And so Darwin just crushed all of that. None of that, you don't, your mind isn't allowed to process the, the, the harmony of parts, the, the interrelationship and or, organizational orientation uh, of, of change. There's no orientation. It's, it's, there is no directionality in the Darwinian system. It's because, again, randomness is a, is a primary causal function. Um, you don't think about the creative leaps. Whereas people, like I mentioned a few other names, right? James Dwight Dana, Carl Ernst von Boehner, Benjamin Silliman, um, uh, Luvier, uh, Cuvier, Lamarck, they were all looking at these variables and bringing us into a real science of creative change, both in nature, but also then that could educate and explain what is it that humans actually do that's nat natural um, by being creative in, in that lawful way. Can I ask you just just quick question? All these, uh, most of these names, to be honest with you, I've never read anything of them, but, but I heard maybe, uh, maybe uh, here and there. Uh, are these also, you know, like 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 it has happened last whatever hundred years or so? Uh, are these scientists, engineers, inventors? Are these part of the of the group of people who have been systematically su suppressed or? Oh yeah. Censored, right? Oh sure. Yeah, you can read yeah. some of their writings, but okay. uh, you, you're not allowed to study any right. of their, I mean, their theories in school. Yeah. No. <laughs> you lose your your uh, your job as a teacher if you try to actually promote. Um, or encourage your students to actually study a lot of these, these individuals. Um, so, okay. So now we, we have now basically the, the gist of what was Darwin doing. Now, Darwin couldn't actually sell his own ideas. He couldn't defend his ideas. They were based on mathematical, not really principles of physics, but mathematical argumentation. He couldn't really defend it in public. And that's why he needed Thomas Huxley. Huxley was somebody who was a young a talented misanthropic person who was brought into the upper echelons. He was discovered, you know, talent searched and uh, given more, more power, more privilege because he just, he was good. He was, he had aptitudes that the empire had lacked because empires, the problem with empires is they tend to get crusty over time. And the, the, the upper level echelons of the master class tend to lose that creative vitality over time, especially their kids get more decadent. And that's that always that always happens. That was the problem of the British Empire of the 19th century. They couldn't compete with the, the in innovative creative ideas that were being driven, especially by the American Revolution. So Huxley was brought in. He, he founded an organization called the X Club to promote um, Darwinian ideas. They founded an, a magazine called Nature Magazine, still today a very popular magazine. That's its origins. And he started uh, basically arranging public uh, debates with um, Anglican fanatics who are supposedly opponents of Darwinism, but they were too dumb to actually debate anything scientifically. And so by ma manufacturing these false debates, always highly publicized by the media that was working very closely with him, they would he then ridiculed and destroyed his opponents and had and won over greater converts to the Darwinian mode of thinking. Um, now Darwin in this mix, now keep in mind, Huxley would never arrange a debate with any of the, the sorts of competent scientists of the von Humboldt school of Germany or anything like that, who I mentioned, they would never do that. It was always with fanatics. That's the one thing that's like getting Tony Blair to, to defend Christianity against a, 
uh, a globalization loving economist. Um, Tony Blair today has become sort of the champion for Christianity and globalization. And uh, and they, they made this big, highly publicized debate where it's like, why are you going to pick Tony Blair to defend Christianity um, against an atheist? Of course, the result was Tony Blair lost his debate, <laughs> you know, of course. And but, you know, a lot of a lot of people who don't know what the hell is going on just watch Tony Blair's lame argumentation. And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess atheism is the way to go. You know, and it's useful for them to do some things like that. Now, Darwin, you, you mentioned Malthus. Darwin, in his autobiography, admits that the theory that gave him the idea of or the solution to natural selection and the, the race for a diminishing in, in a world of diminishing rates of return was uh, in 1838, he writes, how he chanced while I believe he was voyaging in the Beagle. Somebody gave him, I probably Thomas Huxley, I, I would imagine, I don't know. Uh, but somebody gave him uh, a copy of Thomas Malthus's 1799 Essays on the Principle of Population. And he said, it was thus by a greater appreciating these, these factors of, uh, of how um, there is a, a constant race and tension for diminishing returns that I finally was given a theory by which to work. And he admits that that's the foundation stone upon which his structure is built. Now, if you read Thomas Malthus, Thomas Malthus is, an, is a satanic figure. Uh, he's not a scientist. He's not an economist, though. And he, he passes himself off as a reverend he, of the Church of England, of, of, you know, of the Anglican Church. He was a teacher at the British East India Company's Haleybury College, who produced a mathematical uh, pseudoscientific formula for managing population growth by an elite, uh, with the idea that as population grows geometrically, like, uh, you know, Agriculture only reproduces or grows arithmetically, resulting in a Malthusian crisis. And that, that mathematical ratio gives mathematicians at the top of the pyramid the tools needed to calculate not only when the crisis is going to happen, but to mitigate or act preventatively be long before it happens to keep the human population, the, the global herd, in check, utilizing, as Malta says, uh, uh, cutting off support for the unfit. Um, including children, as he says that no the, no parish should supply assistance to any family that has more than one child. After your your first child, there should be all all uh, support cut off. Um, he calls for utilizing, encouraging the the return of the plague, um, the utilization of wars to keep the populations in check. He thinks that these are all like the natural gifts of nature that that the the scientists have to use and manage in what what became known rightfully as the dismal science. So that's that's where the British economy uh, school, and here I'm talking about um, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, um, uh, James Mill, all of the great so-called economists who were taught in school today. If you study micro macroeconomics or business, these are the people that you're taught are the British economists. Adam Smith. And the one child policy in China, is that founded on that, on this, yes. I don't know, pseudos? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. God. Well, the, this is the thing. The, the, the past, so, of course, it's it's not valid anymore. There is no one child policy, anymore, right? Since, no, they, they, they got rid of it in 2015. Oh, they okay. lifted it to two. Then uh, last year, they lifted it to three. And I think under the current planning is to finally abolish it by the end of the uh, 2030, because the Chinese have been, they, they have at least recognized their, the, the failure the, the 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 destructiveness that they did to themselves by this policy, but it wasn't entirely themselves because it, it was done largely because of the neo Malthusian revivalists like Henry Kissinger, who managed the 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 new plan that extracted U.S. industries and put them in China as part of this slave master new set of relations that Kissinger wanted to create, so China would remain in Kissinger's mind, and those like David Rockefeller who managed a lot of conferences in China and Beijing in the 1970s and 80s, um, their idea was that China was going to remain just poor and basically they would, they would just be the forever sweatshop of the world, forever underdeveloped with only a, a rich, deep state uh, billionaire class that would manage locally the, 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 the slaves, the, 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 the masses of poor of China forever on behalf of the wet, their, their controllers in London and some in Washington, but mostly London. That was always supposed to be the forever crystallized model. Now, part of that was bringing in the Club of Rome, which was something that was created in um, 1969, 68, by a couple of eugenics-loving Malthusians. 
um, specifically Aurelio Pichai and uh, uh, who ran Volkswagen the, and, and uh, the Volkswagen Foundation, um, as well as um, Alexander King, who was a, a very high level British, British imperial manager. Um, and the, these guys created this new organization as a way to popularize the idea that computer modeling will help us uh, control population levels and calculate the optimal population for the earth, which their computer models that were sponsored by, they sponsored a, a, a study called the limits to growth run by uh, two MIT uh, mathematicians, Jay Forrester and uh, Dennis Meadows that was produced in 1972, ironically with uh, Canadian money, uh, Canadian taxpayer money funded the study um, because the Canadian branch of the club of Rome was sponsored by none other than Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who's a big club of Rome uh, fanatic and uh, the governor general, Roland Michener, um, who was another Rhodes Scholar, uh, the Governor General of Canada, was another co-founder of this thing, and and, and were quite a few others of, Can of in Canada, including Maurice Strong, one of the co-founders of the World Economic Forum. Now that this model was given its first platform to be popularized at the World, Ec the second meeting of the World Economic Forum, which was managed by you know Henry Kissinger's protege uh, Klaus Schwab, who had been a student under under Kissinger in in Harvard. And also, and, and, and uh, just to ma ma for yeah. our listeners, uh, funded by the CIA, right? I mean, this this whatever school of, or oh yeah, yeah, this is yeah, yeah. Okay. on Whitney Webb's website and Limited Hangout. There's a wonderful article yeah. um, on yeah. on this. It's really quite good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the CIA completely funded this 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 school within Harvard. Yes, and uh, Kissinger himself. Keep in mind, you know, he was yes the the teacher of but of Schwab, but at the same time, he was himself the student and 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 was mentored by. Um, What's his name? Um, a Rhodes Scholar, William Yandel Elliott. So Yandel Elliott um, was sort of the Milner, you know, Cecil Rhodes type of character who had his own kindergarten, just like Milner had his kindergarten in South Africa in the uh, the nineteen, you know, early nineteen hundreds, with all these young sociopathic boys always that he just cultivated and who worshipped him and who became the the managers of the Roundtable movement. It's the same thing for all of these, these, this is a, a template that's utilized. And this is what when William Yandel Elliott managed. Some of his young boys included Kissinger was, a, was a, one of his favorites, but also you had this big new Brzezinski, who was another one of the, the Yandel Elliott boys. So was um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau was a William Yandel Elliott boy. They all had different roles to play in the great game, of course, but they were all part of the same little Rose Scholar nexus. So this is what was part, this is happening in the 1940s, 50s. And, and then, you know, so the World Economic Forum is created. They popularize the limits to growth. They bring in Aurelio Pichai to present his computer models for the world. Um, it takes a while for it to sort of become national policy. Most nations still don't want to do this. They still want to have industrial development instead. Because it's like, yeah, you could, you could solve your use, useless eater overpopulation problem two ways. One, kill the people, right? The way Malthus says or the eugenicists who took the Malthus Darwin policies and, and, and applied it now to a science of population control, purifying the gene pool, which is what Galton did um, by combining it with certain Mendelian uh, genetic ideas, which were some, some of those ideas were fine, but the application of it was horrifyingly unscientific, but it was imperial. So that, that, that's one thing you could, you could kill your useless eaters and overpopulated people, or you could, like I said, make the useless eaters become useful creators. And that involves providing industrial growth, providing education, providing a climate of hope. And when you do these things, you create fertile soil for the proper potentialities of the seed to blossom as it should, um, which is where a lot of the governments of the world were still trying to push in that direction. So they, they didn't like, it wasn't popular to have this, this Malthusian computer modeling system in, in place, you know? And um, and so the World Economic Forum was it was an amplifier for that. And when Kissinger went into China, um, there was a, a series of mathematicians, cyberneticists in China who were absorbed by the Kissinger trilateral app apparatus. They were brought to uh, some Scandinavian conferences, introduced to the Club of Rome models. And uh, one figure was Song Ji, um, father of Chinese uh, rocket science. Um, in, in engineering. He did some good things, but he was really brainwashed on this thing. 
And he brought back the Club of Rome computer models as the solution to the overpopulation projections um, that were being made, you know, and they were all showing very scary, you know, if every, every mother in China is producing, you know, an average of five kids or maybe more, sometimes often more, you could project that linearly and say, okay, by the year 2000, you're going to have, you know, like some scary number and look, you don't have any development. That's going to be a, a, a complete uh, dark age. That'll be an Armageddon. And so these, these scared people sufficiently that, that then the, the Chinese leadership acquiesced to making this one of the accepted conditions upon which they would receive World Bank and IMF funding, as well as U.S. factories, because they, they were desperately in need of having um, some form of factories or industrial growth, especially after the destruction of the, the Cultural Revolution, which, which was a big self-mutilation. I mean, China was hurting badly from that, that experience. So that is part of the recovery process. They needed the industry, but the condition was do the one child thing. So it wasn't even an, an, indigenous, an indigenously Chinese policy ever, even at the beginning. It was always brought in and enforced upon them uh, by these external forces who both wanted to destroy China ultimately and keep them a slave society, as well as destroy Russia, as well as destroy the United States. It's the same oper operatives who are not nationally bounded anywhere. They just utilize their fifth columns in any country to achieve their objective, which is total feudalism. That's their objective including dumbed down, deindustrial, underpopulated, pop, you know, uh, human talking cows. So all that to say, this is what, what Galton did was he was the first to sort of say, you know, and he has many speeches, the, the cousin of Darwin who formulated eugenics that, that, that the science of eugenics, he said, he said, I see no reason why this should not become a replacement for the religions of the world why we cannot have a new religion of eugenics. And the governing class that he was a part of made it their religious-like motive to not only have a version of this for themselves, but also subversions of it for the masses. Because you couldn't, you couldn't let every level of the hierarchy of society, every caste, in on the same uh, degree of, relig of the religion, right? You can't let them all in. So you have to have these, these versions that are just diluted. Um, and that's why when you listen to the popularized, dumbed down Darwinism that we're, we're teaching our kids in, in, you know, most universities, it's a very different approach to, to, to thinking about it than the governing class with their transhumanist ideology uh, learns and believes in. There's similarities, but there's also things that are very different. Um, you know, the, the merging of human beings of, bi of biology with machines, right? to uh, make us relevant going into our, the new age of CRISPR genetic manipulation or uh, artificial intelligence replacing human beings. So you got all of these different flavors of the same ultimate thing, which is anti-creative. It's based on a closed system ideology that the, whatever exists now is all that ever could exist. And so we have to ban things that cause disequilibrium. And it is in total opposition to what we currently see and I, I mentioned this at the beginning, I didn't finish my thought, but at the very beginning, I mentioned 10 years ago, the current collapsing rigged game was the only game in town. Today, there's a, a, an opposing system to the, the closed rigged game that's about to, or that is being demolished. And that other system actually is viable because it's founded on certain principles. And that, that article you referenced by uh, Larry Romanov on my website um, is one one of many ways of looking at this system of bountiful create creative uh, change. Wow, it's fascinating. Yeah, we should go into that. I mean, whenever you're finished with that, uh, um, yeah, thread. So, yeah, it's, it's, but it's the it's the Eurasian system. If people want to get a sense of it, look, read the speeches of the uh, the Eurasian um, Economic Union Summit that just happened on. Yeah, you on mentioned that like a couple of times now. Your last interviews, uh, it was Iran also involved in that, yeah. or um, they were. I think they they had observers there. Okay. They're, they're not part of the Eurasian Economic Union, but they, they, do, they are highly integrated into the, Euro, the greater Eurasian partnership of Russia, okay. China, Iran. Yeah. India is increasingly on board. Pakistan Can you give is me like board. a short background? Like what's the objective? What's, what's, the, or what, what's the purpose of this whole Eurasian thing? It's Sorry. a survivor's. Well, for, on first and foremost, it, it, it started off in the, in the late 90s, which was what became the, the G20, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, of Russia, China were the, were the uh, foundation stones 
And again, it started off as a survivor's club in response to the growing New World Order in the post-Cold War age. And it has, especially in the last uh, seven, eight years, really grown fast, especially since the Belt and Road Initiative became the official foreign policy of China with a completely alternative um, system of balance of payments, uh, alternatives to SWIFT built by Russia, by China, that are increasingly allowing for the settlement of payments and of, of trade in local currencies instead of U.S. dollars. It's increasingly based not on speculative um, speculative activities of the casino economy, but it's based on the creation of uh, real commodities, the digging up like gold, wheat, finished goods. So you actually have real uh, metrics in the real world justifying the behavior of the monetary system there, which it has increased. Like I said, Iran has joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, the Eurasian Economic Union has uh, increasingly integrated with China under several treaties since 2015 um, to create a new sort of block. Um, that's, that's six countries of the Eurasian Economic Union plus China. Glaziev, a leading um, economic scientist and advisor to Putin, is in charge largely of macroeconomic integration of Eurasia. And what's most important is it's based upon certain concepts of inter-civilizational cooperation. So rather than seeing things in the Western paradigm of borders of nation states that fight for local self-interest, there is an idea of the sovereignty of nations, but more importantly, it's being superseded by an idea of, inter of civilizational force, that there's these ancient civilizations representing cultural, linguistic, ethnic, religious groups, but that have a harmonious coexistence as human beings first. It's very antithetical to everything that critical race theory represents, right? Um, which is that there is no unifying characteristic of human beings. You are your, your, your primary identity is your gender, is your uh, uh, sub, whatever, whatever, um, or whatever gender you want to create for yourself, right, is your primary identity. Whatever uh, skin tone you are, that's your primary identity. H however abused you are by some um, abuser, uh, other race, usually white males, um, that's who you are. There, the idea that there's something universal is completely antithetical to the critical race theory, um, politically correct, liberal or order, which is the ethic of the, the rules-based international order. It's, you know, it's the open society of Soros. Everything is so open that there is no truth, right? Everything is true. We accept all truths as being equal, except those truths or accept those opinions that say that they're, that they're, um, that they're right, right? So we, we, we respect every single gender as being equal, having equal claim to, to truth, all 5,000 genders, um, except those opinions that say that there's just male and female. If that's the case, that's, that's tyrannical authoritarian and must be destroyed. Um, so all that to say, the, the idea of the Eurasian Alliance has a different uh, ethical, uh, philosophical, uh, political, economic, and security paradigm built into it and it has a military component of uh, of mutual of mutual defense it's not offensive but it's defensive that's why china has only one military base outside of china um and hasn't started any wars in the past century i think maybe one circumstantial thing in in the 70s with vietnam but that's messy um the u.s has started what i don't, I don't even know how many wars right how, how many it has like 900 bases outside of its own borders yeah um, so it's that plus it's the idea of banking is founded upon long-term thinking, low interest loans and cooperation with, I mean, look at the, the, the high speed rail networks. There's almost 40,000 kilometers built in China now in the past 20 years, 23 years ago, there was zero. Now there's 40,000. That's going to, that's growing at a, at a geometric rate. Um, are these Russia, also part of the maglev uh, trains like like yeah. in japan uh, like yeah. definitely a little high speed right okay yeah like china has a lot these are high speed this mm -hmm. means we're talking here between 300 to 600 kilometers an hour wow. speeds super fast you can go to beijing to shanghai in like three and a half hours it's a huge thing that would take those same distances in canada where we have 1950s rail tech no no high speed that same distance would take upwards of something like 14 hours or so to uh, to make that same transit. So the, the idea of space time itself is bending in a in a sort of um, very 
specific way. You have you have a compression of space time, and that's what good human economies are supposed to be. The more human beings gain knowledge of the universe, the universe, what we see, going back to ancient times, that the universe responds, it resonates to our true ideas that we put into action by giving us a power of greater integration, greater um, speed at which goods are both created, move, and are consumed. And you have uh, what's called a, an, an increased community of principle of, of producers and consumers uh, interacting, interfacing together in, in space and in time. And it, new technologies allow this to happen, you know, where let's say electricity allows for the communication of signals, first in telegraph and then in words, in spoken words, you know, vocally. That allows all of a sudden things that had taken formally, you know, four months or whatever, I, I don't know how long, to go to send a letter from Europe to uh, New York. Maybe it was probably more like a month. All of a sudden, that speed takes minutes to today, split seconds, you know? And so what we have now in China, especially with quantum computing coming online, high-speed rail maglev is increasingly coming online, um, and it is, is an idea of both applying technology and the money associated with the behavior of technology's investments into things that both benefit individual investors while at the same time benefit the national structures as a whole. So that type of both coherence of a whole, which is which requires stability, as well as the flexibility of change, which is usually the opposite of stability, right? It's hard to balance the two. But you need the two. <laughs> you need to be both have to have responsibility as well as desire, right? As an individual, the duty freedom paradox. That's the same problem for a nation. How do you cherish the the need for the free the, the each individual to have freedom and creative expression, while at the same time having a, a stability and coherence of the the nation's structures and administration as a whole? So China's trying to they're doing a pretty good job finding that balance. Russia's a little bit further behind, but they're also moving in the, the right orientation. They've They've done a better job of de-weeding their deep state garden, their fifth columnists, than we have. In our, in our case, our fifth columnists are running our policies. In the case of Eurasia, they're either extracted and burnt, subdued, or they're in negligible positions currently. They're still they're, they're there in China. They're there in Russia, uh, in many cases, waiting to take control at the first opportunity. Um, but they're not driving the ship. So that's very different point of differentiation of discernment that people have to have in mind um going into this because that's the other that's the only boat that floats the current boat that we're in is designed it's designed to be a titanic it's it's, it's right the hull is had structure built in structural <laughs> uh deficiencies that were designed to tank at the slightest poke and now the poke is happening so we're tanking if we're going to have survival for humanity it will be because we harmonize our interests with what is currently happening with the Arctic development strategies of Russia, the, the consolidation. I mean, Putin is using the opportunity of the, the developments in Ukraine right now, certainly, to, uh, to consolidate um, as much uh, power as he can. The, there's still a lot of fight back and pushback, especially amongst groupings within the, the Russian central bank, which is, which is contaminated with a lot of IMF-affiliated operatives. So there's a fight happening there. Um, we see it between the Glazia faction, right, which which represents real patriots, real nationalists. Um, I, I know for a fact that Putin is definitely a part of that one. But at the same time, there's power structures that are defending the enemies of the nationalists. Again, congealing around the uh, the big pharma, pseudical com companies uh, that are tied to the World Health Organization in Russia, as well as the banking complex of the, the 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 Bank of Russia, which is still a private bank, unlike China, China has been able to maintain its its state controls over its banks. It did not allow them to be privatized in the '90s. Uh, Russia failed to do that, so they have a different element of fight. But yeah, I mean, again, Iran is increasingly um, on board. Um, we know Syria, a lot of countries of, of Southwest Asia, pretty much everybody who was not invited to uh, Biden's you know global democracy summit has their hearts and minds in that that other more viable paradigm including south america including much of africa so that's the that's the fight today darwinian versus anti-darwinian systems of social organization you talk sometimes about um, maybe it's a more general definition but you talk maybe about the unipolar versus the multipolar now yeah. i'm to be honest i mean i'm not a fan of either of those because i mean in long term uh, 
you know, I mean, I, I, I get it, you know, that, for example, uh, let's, let's just, uh, for the sake of it, you know, let's just name Russia uh, or Putin himself is not like uh, he's a, uh, he's anti, you know, anti transhumanist or anti, you know, uh, this, this uh, old new world order agenda. But um, would you say, um, because you, you know, you sometimes mention in your interviews, well, what they like about China, you know, is the, uh, what they love to adopt is the, uh, you know, the surveillance, the social credit system, the technocratic system, but not the industrialization, the productivity and stuff like that. So, but in the long term, I mean, isn't it more like in general, whether, you know, whoever, with whatever faction or, or, or structure wins or, or overwhelms the system globally, would you say that it's, um, you know, it's more about, uh, at, the end, at the end of the day, it's about control. It's about, you know, exerting your control, you know, or their control structures. Okay. Uh, well, the way I'd answer this, look, is um, I have both my my ideals of, like, where I believe personally. Like, I have certain theories of where I see um, our healthy society being in the future. And then I have the real world that I live in with its real power structures and real intentions that currently exist, which is quite a few steps removed from I, what I believe to be our eventual age of, of maturation as a, as a proper species, self-aware of our own nature, acting in accordance with natural law. So I have my ideals, <laughs> but I'm not so committed to just thinking in an ivory tower way that I cannot see the practical battles happening currently. And there's, there's like real hardcore fights happening in my world today um, with certain realities. Um, so based on that, yeah, I believe that personally in time as human beings, as culture um, matures and self perfects that the individuals within the culture, every individual, because like, culture is sort of the spiritual field. It's not just, art, music, literature, philosophy, it's, it's the, all of this invisible, rich field that shapes the cultivation of our souls. It's the, it's the soil in which the seed of our soul will grow or will be stifled, is culture. Um, as that grows properly, the individuals within, um, I believe, will increasingly come earlier and earlier to the recognition that they that their duties, that they're right with the, the things we so-called must do as part of being a social species are actually reasonable and even desirable. And that the, satisf the, the satisfaction, the pleasure our souls get um, when we act in wisdom, making discoveries, sharing discoveries, doing good works for others, you know, all the things that make us better spiritually, psychologically are actually superior forms of pleasure than the pleasures of the flesh cake, sex, other things. Those are fine. I'm not saying don't have sex, don't have cake, but I'm saying that it's an inferior uh, order of pleasure than the higher pleasures. And you'd be willing to sacrifice those lower pleasures in order to preserve the higher pleasures. And that that sort of, it's a Confucian idea as well, learning to place the values where they, they should be, the correct, the, the correct, correcting the words that you use and placing the words in the right uh, set of uh, parameters and the right values, right? Um, so you don't value things that shouldn't be valued. You, you, you value things that should be valued, right? So all that to say, as that society does grow, I think that we will have less, there will be less need to have um, systems of laws that command us to do what we should do, right? You don't need that. If people want to do what they should do, increasingly, they have wisdom. You don't need to have such, you know, laws like that. It's like, you know, like Jesus said when he was asked by a rabbi who was trying to trick him, like, what's the most important of the Ten Commandments? And he did a creative answer. He said, well, to love God and love your fellow man mm -hmm. like you love yourself. And so he didn't answer any of these ne negative must thou must or must not mm -hmm. uh, laws, which is perfectly fine to have those must and must lo not laws. If, if people are confused, it's like, yeah, it's right there, you know, but it's not it's not bad to kill your neighbor because the law says don't kill it's bad because of there there's a deeper reason and it just so happens to be that the law says don't do it so snap in right whereas christ said well you know love god love your fellow man and if you do those things you obey the golden rule all of the other things will follow so he made it a positive thing right love and so i think it's like that for laws 
um, people will want to engage in things that have greater value. So, okay, back to your question. Um, I think that at certain times when societies, here's a problem. When the society goes into a situation where the population is um, dumbed down, where the masses don't know how to control themselves, the individual loses the sense of priorities of like what's right, what's wrong, who am I, what gender am I? When you have that type of decay, or also when you have a, a, a process um, where you're under attack, like where you have an enemy that wants to destroy you and the population doesn't understand it or know how to react, sometimes that society has a choice. They could either collapse, they could just be destroyed, let the, let the hordes come in, or uh, sometimes you will have the necessity for um, like a, what's, you know, a strong person might have to come in sometimes and restore order. And it might seem like personal liberties are being infringed in order to preserve the nation, the civilization, and the ultimate well-being of the people. But they don't know that sometimes. That's sometimes what happens. So it's not always bad. In the case of China today, there is social credit, which I find distasteful. And there's a surveillance state, which I find distasteful. The problem is China has been under, there's no, there is an intention to destroy China. There is a war against China, which has a multifaceted asymmetrical dynamic to it. There's, there's thousands of organizations that have infiltrated through, you know, various NED CIA um, operations that try, that have been trying for decades now to break up China by creating an inflaming separatist movements using ethno-nationalist ideologies, whether it's in Tibet or Xinjiang or uh, Southern Mongolia or Hong Kong or Taiwan, or there's a few others. The, there's so much effort to create, they, they're, they're doing the same thing. They've done the same thing in, in the U S they've been trying to do it in Russia to create like, you know, 14 micro states under Zbigniew Brzezinski's, you know, eth ethno nationalist divided micro nations of Russia, all behold, beholden to the IMF. They've been doing the same thing to China divide to conquer. Uh, China has had to fight against that. They've had to fight against fifth columnists embedded within the Chinese communist party. This is what, what Xi Jinping has been cracking down on since 2012 when the biggest anti-corruption um, uh, program was ever put into place. Like a million and a half um, members of the Chinese Communist Party have been either complete, some have been arrested, some have been completely uh, taken down of all, they've been kicked out of the party, all of their privileges have been removed. People like Jack Ma, who's a World Economic Forum freak, a, a trustee, has been, uh, he, he pulled for pretty much a financial insurrection, <laughs> a coup, in China, and he was, you know, taken taken down from power. So they have these things. A lot of this is being directed by MI6, by the CIA. Like HSBC still runs the. They print the money for Hong Kong, right? People think, oh yeah, Hong Kong is not British anymore. It's like no, it's called the CIA of the Pacific for a reason. HSBC that's based in London still prints Hong Kong money. That's what's on oh, the yeah, Hong Kong. Not to mention the trillions of money laundering, not only but through HS, HBC, HSBC, but through so many other banks and central banks. But yeah, so you have I all of this stuff to destroy <laughs> China on top of the military encirclement to create a NATO of the Pacific uh, with saber rattling, you know, 50,000 U.S. troops with the U.S. military industrial complex stationed in Japan. You got another twenty eight thousand with bioweapons as well, based in uh, South Korea. Um, you have a lot of evidence that these uh, that there's been a lot of uh, bio lab shady activity that has been deployed already for the past 20 years from South Korea. Or no, Obama started these programs in 2010, Jupiter and Centaur. Um, that and have been you, Ukraine, how many bio labs are there? I mean, or over in, 30, over 30. Jesus. Okay. Um, there's another similar amount in, in Georgia. So all that to say, like. If we we don't know what China would be today if there wasn't a war to destroy them on so many levels. Unfortunately, because there is, they've had to both, you know, uh, keep their system from uh, disintegrating to extract all of these millions of operatives and agencies masquerading under religious organizations um, affiliated with something that wants to kill them. Um, and other humanitarian organizations that actually have very insidious motives. So they have this whole thing. And uh, we see how it's taken control of the United States. We've seen how these things have taken control successfully of Europe. And yet, so yeah, they've had to do certain, like imp bring online certain things. The, the question is, 
are those things evil because of what they are as far as mass surveillance and uh, social credit or are they evil based upon their intention to enslave and destroy are they perpetual is this something that i see evidence that china would would always do or is this something that's part of a, a weapon used in battle currently mm. can um, i ask would you yeah. comment uh, because there's you know when it comes to human rights and uh because Alex Gladstein, you know, one of the Bitcoiners and, and from the Human Rights Foundation, also it was a beautiful conference like recently. I mean, he, he often talks about the Uyghurs. Uh, what, how do you pronounce it? Uyghur? Uyghurs. Yeah. I mean, the million Uyghurs uh, who've been imprisoned or enslaved, I don't know, or, uh, maybe even exploited or their organs taken out in China. I mean, what, what's up to, with that? I mean, how much truth is, is I mean, why, why is that in the first place? Why? Yeah. No, I think I think it's a lot of Freudian projection. I mean, we're we're taking things that we do, like I mean, America has the biggest private private prison system using slave labor right. exactly. in the world. Where most of these people working for the military industrial complex, because a lot of the the equipment that it, that's used by the military um, of the United States is produced in in prison slave labor camps where people get paid twenty five cents to thirty cents a day, mm. or no, sorry, an hour. But still, come on. Um, judges across the United States, there's been several who have been found guilty for taking bribes from the prison industrial oh, complex. Yeah. The corruption uh, runs deep. It's yeah, for like assigning yeah. juvenile delinquents to for doing petty crimes to sentences that destroy their lives up to 10 years so that they could just be cheap labor. So we've been doing this on a, on the, the biggest la scale ever in modern history, as far as I could see. And... Um, as you know, and the incarceration levels are the highest per capita of, of any developed country in the United States. So, I mean, we've got this thing and we're doing what's called, again, Freudian projection is you, you do what you do. And then as all sociopaths and narcissists do that, you know, they take their own worst uh, traits and they project it onto their enemy that they want to destroy, despite the fact that their enemy that they want to destroy may not have any of those problems. Um, so in fact, yeah, when you do scratch, Gray Zone has done some wonderful research on uh, and exposés debunking a lot of the narratives that we're being fed about what China is doing with organ harvesting of the Falun Gong uh, pra practitioners or using slave labor in uh, Xinjiang. Um, there's a lot of work to debunk that. And that's almost a show unto itself. But I would say if people want to um, dig into that, I, this these arguments or the debunking of it uh, takes up uh, five chapters of my new book, um on uh, towards the eurasian manifest destiny volume three, volume three? yeah of yeah. my clash of the two Americas series uh -huh. um so i think like chapters 23 to 30 um all tackle this in various ways including mapping out the chinese and russian deep state operations fantastic uh, yep and so again the i could tell you just very quickly um it's bunk like like if you're being told that this is the case that china is uh utilizing the the organs that they're just like <laughs> uh kidnapping falun gong people who are it's kind of like a scientology cult by the way with a with a leader who's based in the usa in philadelphia and a giant compound a multi-billionaire who has a multifaceted hydra of corporations media outlets and other things including um a religion under his own name um li hongji and he's been based, provided sanctuary in this giant estate in the USA. He's a he has all the profiles of a MK Ultra type operative who believes he is like a messiah of the brother of Christ who is doing battle with aliens, um, interdimensional aliens fighting over good and evil. And he is the conduit keeping balance of the of, in the cosmos. He actually believes this stuff. It's it's very similar to L. Ron Hubbard's ideology. Oh, really? Okay. Um, very similar. It's like a Chinese version of it. Okay. Um, and it just masquerades under this, these meditation, you know, Qigong techniques to attract a lot of like, just, you know, gullible white people mostly into it. Um, but then, yeah, you start discovering later on that he actually has this whole cosmology. He's, he's a nut job, but it's, again, it's, it's a CIA operation to destroy China culturally as are many operations of the sort. And Xinjiang, I'll just say it very quickly, China shares a 70 kilometer border with Afghanistan, and they have had hundreds of terrorist attacks since 9-11. It wasn't just the West facing these things. Mm -hmm. These terrorists are being funded by the CIA, by, by Saudi Arabia and other operatives, um, and have were created in the first place by Zbigniew Brzezinski, a star of our show, um, Trilateral Commission Brzezinski. 
um, in the first place to fight the Soviet Union um, by funding radical madrasas that would radicalize young jihadis, which gave birth to Al Qaeda. So China has dealt with this. They've had, again, many people, many Chinese die of terrorist incidents. They had to deal with this thing. Um, they chose to not bomb any country back to the Stone Age in their approach to dealing with their terrorist problem. Um, keep in mind, again, they have much more um, self-interest with sharing a border with Afghanistan than America does half the world away, bombing that country back to the Stone Age. Um, so they did it in a different way. And they, that involved take like basically cutting off Saudi funding to the Wahhabite radical, most radicalized interpretations of the Quran that was radicalizing a lot of young people and radical imams that were recruiting people to, to go and fight against the Russians in Syria and against, uh, you know, uh, Bashar al-Assad. And again, a lot of Uyghurs fight in Syria, a lot, a lot of fought and do fight in Iraq as part of Al-Qaeda operations. Um, that's part of the reality that we live in. So that had to be stopped. They have, despite that, not crushed the Muslim culture by any means. There's over 24,000 mosques in uh, Xinjiang, um, as well as another several hundred uh, churches, Christian churches, both Catholic and Protestant. There's Taoist temples, Buddhist temples. There is no crushing of religion. It's just that you, part of the Chinese constitution mm -hmm. is that you cannot um, receive it as um, a religious organization. You are not allowed to receive foreign money. That's part of the Chinese constitution of 1983. It says directly, you cannot receive foreign money to be a foreign agency um, inside masquerading as a religion because that's destroyed China, even going back to the 19th century with the uh, various uh, civil wars that they had to deal with in the 1850s, 60s. And um, you have to have a license. So you have to have a like, like basically you have to be approved by the state. You, you still, they still use the Bible. They use the Quran. They use Buddhist scriptures. Um, and as far as the, the cheap labor thing, no, no. I mean, you, you have right now uh, trade schools, like what they do have for the worst elements, like the people who are the most radicalized and indoctrinated into jihadism and like the worst elements of radical uh, Islamic terrorism. Yeah, they've had um, centers where you can't leave until you right. really show your stuff that you're you're repenting and living a new life. But for the most part, there's there's high speed rail. There's more infrastructure being developed in Xinjiang than ever before in history. It plays a key role as a bridge between the Silk Road and uh, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, everywhere else. Um, there's more development happening. There's been something like a thousand percent increase in per capita GDP. The average life expectancy 60 years ago went from about 39 years of age till today. Now it's about 71. Um, there is faster internet than there is here, but there's also cultural centers. They're not crushing the traditions or the language of the, the Uyghurs, the Uyghur Muslims. Okay, you, but just, just to round this up with the question with hmm. the Uyghur, I mean, how much truth is there? I mean, is there, uh, I mean, actually like 1 million Uyghurs, like uh, no. however you pronounce it, in camps or in prison? In no. Or is it all on, like... Uh, you scratch propaganda? on those arguments? No. No, there's not. If you scratch on the arguments, they fall apart. They, it's, it's all accusation and repetition. And they use some shady satellite images um, where they're like, oh, look at that. That's a camp. Look, there's like a wall around the, that must be a concentration camp. And they tell you what you're looking at. But then when you actually look at the evidence of what you've just been shown, it turns out to be a school. And most schools that I have in Canada have fences around the school. Um, so they, they, they misframe. It's narrative reframing and then utilizing emotionally charged images out of context to get you in a state of hysteria that activates cr some prejudices that Westerners have about big, bad, godless, atheistic China which has been put there since the Cold War, which they're just reactivating and playing our emotions. But it's just emotional thinking. It's not actually evidence. And everything I've looked at, every time I scratch on a claim, I find it just it just falls apart. Interesting. So yeah. is there anything, I mean, is there anything substantial, I mean, that you would criticize about China or the whatever, the policies, how they conduct themselves? I mean, something that's really so grotesque or so atrocious. There's a few things. I mean, look, I think that uh, China is... Um, the, they're not willing to, it's kind of like a traumatized family. Mm -hmm. and it, what, what people who, who've gone through trauma in a family unit, they will often see the problem of, of like, we don't talk about that. But, you know, look what, what Uncle Bill did to uh, my, my, my sister, you know, 
it's like no we don't talk about that you <laughs> know what's you know, like an, an abusive narcissistic father figure or something you know like and that did a lot of terrible damage to the and the only way to recover is to have that open conversation about what went wrong how did we allow this to happen for so long whatever that trauma is right um so it's really i don't think healthy to uh avoid that conversation and pretend everything's peachy king for you know i think that in my analysis my i might piss off some of my 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 chinese friends uh, but i think that there there should be a lot more openness to discuss the mistakes of the past uh -huh. russia is much better at that they're they're but they're, they're afraid. Much... i mean most people are afraid i mean especially if you live in china you can't have talks you can't have open talk i mean maybe if you are you know eh, live outside in foreign countries i mean it's not as bad as you think man i mean you're you're allowed to it's just if you're in a position of influence like if you're a, a somebody who has power um then there's there's more accountability to you speaking in ways that are uh um overly critical <laughs> of uh, yeah, China. Yeah. However, like for the most part, the, your average person in China is allowed to say like whatever, the, like whatever they want to say. There's very little uh, retribution to just having opinions. Um, and I got a lot of people I know who have all sorts of problems. Some people even work for Chinese news who don't like, they don't believe in the zero COVID policy. I don't believe in it. I think that that's a stupid thing. However, um, they're not getting fired. They're not getting destroyed. Their, their social credit rating is not being like diminished. For those people who have done things that I, I've known, who have had social credit scores diminished. And again, I'm, I'm not a fan of social credit, okay? I'm just saying it's there. <laughs> um, you can recover it relatively easily. Like it's very easy to recover social credit. Unlike the the type of, of uh, like we have social credit already in North America, right? Like if you went to a freedom convoy protest <laughs> uh, for yeah, your freedoms exactly. in Ottawa, your bank accounts were frozen. We're frozen, yeah. That's a new like. If you do something or say something that the government doesn't like, you will be censored. You you can be fired. Um, there's people who are still in prison right now in the U.S. for just having presented themselves at a January sixth uh, protest yeah, yeah. in Washington. There's people who are unhirable. They've they've gone bankrupt several times, and when you go bankrupt, you cannot. It's not easy to get out of of like having no credit, right? You can You can't get a loan. You can't. Your your life is really shackled. And yeah, that is something yeah stuck so to. it's another form of social yeah you're right yeah oh, yeah so it's, it's hypocritical i think like there's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot lack of humility in looking at our own problems before trying to right. uh cast blame on uh, the problems we see from china again oftentimes without context and uh and so i think that china could do better at like talking about more openly the the self mutilation that had happened under things like the cultural revolution that was a like it's you're allowed to say it was a bad decision. That's now people were given the liberty in the 70s by uh, Deng Xiaoping to say, okay, we're allowed to criticize. Well, like we're allowed to say Mao is not a god. <laughs> you know, we're allowed to criticize that cultural revolution as being a bad decision. But to really flesh it out, like how did that happen? How did Zhao Ziyang, George Soros's agent, become the president, the head of the the Chinese Communist Party from 1987 to 88, 89, mm -hmm. and and before that premier? How did they, how did that happen? Because to treat everything as if it's been a progressive step towards uh, a great just society ever, you know, from the, the 1911 revolution to the present with no errors along the way creates, I think, false confidence, mm -hmm. um, a lot of blind spots about what your own weaknesses are that could be capitalized by your enemies and a population which doesn't think as critically as it needs to. So I think that that needs to be one thing that could definitely change. Um, the other things, like I said, I'm, I think that the zero COVID policy, I, I don't think that that's wise. However, at the same measure, there's battles happening that I don't fully understand. So I know that China has chosen, as has Russia, to not directly call out the fraud of man-made global warming. They've chosen not to. Do, they're going along with the narrative that has been thrust on the world that human beings are causing. Yeah, this is one uh, example I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. on the one hand, if if I would like to see national governments call out the the crap and the fake science of that whole thing and simply just say this is bunk, this is this is a, a depopulation agenda to destroy humanity. I would like to hear people say that in political power. Yeah, why don't they, yeah, why don't the, why don't they? Why Well, I think that as soon as they do that, as soon as you call out the game like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you're basically at World War 3 mode now because you're you're pretty much saying any type of chance of having diplomatic maneuverability with your opponents 
which is the Eurasian approach right now to foreign policy, is to try to find, they're trying to resonate with sanity. They've provided us as many opportunities to find something sane within ourselves that they can negotiate with and talk to. But are um, we already close to World War Three? I mean, Matthew, this is what was well, last thing when they. Not, I mean, they are literally provoking a World War Three. I mean, or is it just a theater? I mean, I mean, no, I'm no, really no, no. Sure. They're 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 provoking World War Three, and I agree. Like since February, things have accelerated on a much faster track than they were. Things were moving fast before that, but it shifted gears and went faster um, down that spiral. Now, the oligarchy would prefer to avoid World War III. That is not a favorable scenario outcome of the launching of thermonuclear weaponry around the world. There's a lot of chaos, a lot of, uh, a they lose a lot of control and their their chance of their own self-annihilation increases quite a bit. Like it's, it, so that's the least preferable scenario of the many scenarios that are at play right now. It doesn't mean they're not, they're not willing to do it, right? It just means that they're, they'd rather not. <laughs> They would rather that everybody just agree that China and Russia and Iran and other countries simply let go of their delusional belief that they can succeed in creating a new viable system. Go, go back 10 years into the past. Everybody just get back in the, on the Titanic, get back in the cage and just agree to a slow, peaceful kill, right? A culling of the herd in a, in a more clean way, right? With more drugs, psychedelics, metaverses for everybody as we don't pay attention to the destruction of our food supply. That's a more preferable approach. The fact that these Eurasian powers don't seem to be at all willing to go back in time and to do this increases the, the, the reality of things getting hotter and hotter. Um, I think it's for that reason that, I mean, China's dealing with an opponent that has control of thousands of nuclear weapons surrounding them. Even in the Pacific, there's nuclear you know, sub, there's nuclear submarines holding Trident missiles, each one with a, a kill factor of thousands and thousands of times more than anything we saw with Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And not only conventionally, uh, by the way, Nasty, I mean, they're especially Russia or and China and even maybe Iran. I'm not sure. That's this one I was going to just you know, yeah. go into just uh, short for a few minutes. Like they're technologically advanced. I mean, not only conventionally, uh, conventional weapons, but I mean, when you think of hypersonic or EMPs or I don't know, whatever, or even defensive technologies, would you say they're much more advanced? And this is why the US or whatever Anglo-American military industrial complex knows that. Is that, would that be a, uh, like a, a, a truth? I mean. Well, R Russia has exhibited technologies since 2018 of, like you said, there's hypersonic uh, missiles that can go far faster than the speed of light and yet still bear a nuclear uh, warhead. You have a variety of underground drones that can carry nuclear warheads that Russia has unveiled. Uh, China has recently done a test of a hypersonic missile that went around the earth and missed their target pretty, but by not a large margin, which is far beyond anything that we've seen from the capacities of the same technologies from the US military industrial complex. So I think that at the very least, this is exhibited. It has destroyed the game theory models that the West is following that have uh, convinced through again, always mathematical probability thinking. That's what these, these uh, game theory models are based upon, just like Darwinism, just like our current, you know, basket case economy. It's all probability mathematics. It's 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 unreal. But they've persuaded leading idiotic NATO NATO file generals that a nuclear war is winnable under certain prob uh, systems of probability, um, under certain conditions where the U.S. takes out the response capabilities of Russia and China. That has been what they've been operating on for over twenty years under full spectrum dominance. The, the full spectrum encirclement of Russia and China containment. Um, so these new techs, these new technologies, I think have disproven those theories and have demonstrated that no, you could try, you could you could launch an attack, but at the same time, with these new tech, these new hypersonics and other things, we can certainly do more damage to to you, or at least take you out as well. So that that throws a lot of those theories out of the window. Now, is there tech that I don't know about? Sure, maybe. Undoubtedly, there's classified. There's definitely. I mean, yeah. just because it's not publicly accessible, this is this is one of yeah. my favorite topics. But you know, I mean, it's it's a whole wormhole. Uh, where it's a wormhole. Yeah, I mean, worms. but you know, there's electromagnetic weaponry. There's other yeah. things. Plasma, um, plasma technology, or electro, uh, magnetic gravitational. Uh, yeah, on both technology. sides, right? That have been working on it. Yeah. Um, 
So there's that factor too. So, I mean, I'm limited to what I can say. Yeah, we don't have the evidence, but you know, I mean, we yeah. know for a fact, if you listen to Ketan Austin Fitz, or others, you know, inside whistleblowers are experts. I mean, where did all the tens and tens of, I don't know how many, how many trillions of dollars or, or fiat money, you know, been poured into this compartmentalized, uh, this, you know, non-disclosed uh, technologies? Oh, yeah. So there, there's there's that factor in the whole thing. And, and that's why it's it's very important just to go, to go back to original question. Like, what is it that um, these countries are committed primarily to survival and non-depopulation, non-global government. Like mm-hmm. the unipolar idea is based on the idea that there will be one pole, one center of command that controls the entire system, right? One executive branch that controls everything under a, a system, which is simply the whole, the, the sum is the whole of its parts in a system of diminishing returns forever until some asteroid comes that that destroys us that, you know, and then it's, a, it's, it's all a big joke. So that's the one paradigm. That and just watch Netflix sci- sci- sci-fi movies uh, that you're being conditioned to uh, or you know to watch, yeah. and you'll get a sense of the type of of nihilistic thinking that they want our entire society to embrace right. as part of this go nowhere uh, new existence. The other view is based upon an idea of a mutual respect for the sovereignty of various countries that can have a deliberation process and not imposing your values onto the system as a whole. That's much more healthy, and I think it's much more in communion with what I said earlier about my view of what a, an overall down, down the line mature healthy society will be has to pass through certain stages organically before we can get to the Gene Roddenberry, you know, Star Trek uh, ideal, which is I believe that that's sort of more in alignment with what I think human beings are capable and destined to do. Um, as a creature of, of definitely discovery, yeah, right? of time. Yeah. yeah. So, but again, you can't skip steps. And I think part of the not skipping of steps is moving through a multipolar system first, learning how to do that properly. And as we learn how to do that properly, then we can then take the next step of mastery of ourselves and our society by going forward. Now, part of that involves not blowing up the world um, and undoing the, the experiment. So I think, yeah, again, like China and Russia have been trying to avoid blowing up the world and are trying to, they're like doing a a dance with the devil in a sense. And that involves kind of using your enemy's momentum as much as you can against it. And if there's a momentum with the lie, the narrative of man-made global warming, it's almost become a new secular religion. You can't just tell a foreign people that their entire religious order is a fraud. That will will be a, a great way to drive them into hysterics um including the the leadership class as well as the masses so they're they're playing i think a certain game right now of if you can't just say it's a lie to at least try to control how the response to globalization is going to unfold will it be done the way the depopulation freaks want to be done of you know destroying industrial technology shutting down hydrocarbons uh dumbing down the people and make them making them all nature worshiping idiots Or is it going to be with the increased utilization of hydrocarbons, which, yes, that's what China and Russia and India are all doing. Um, They're they're putting some money, some excess money into investing in windmills and solar panels, largely that are generating energy for their residential buildings. They're not utilizing that energy for their industries. It's on a scale. I mean, (laughs) yeah, it's like, you know, it's it's a little bit of a loss that they're taking. But overall, they're using it in a smart way because, yes, you can have residential energy based on on solar panels but you can't sustain industrial capital energy especially for eight billion people and you know uh, exponentially increasing exactly so we're that's what we're being told to do with our green new deal and build back better whereas them they're they're using it in in an appropriate way but they're going for nuclear power they're going for fusion power uh, they're going for every form of hydrocarbon you could imagine and they're helping other countries develop their hydrocarbon needs in africa and other things because it's like yeah tell an african a society living in starvation and no industrialization that they have to just have windmills and solar panels. Yeah. Good luck. When, 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 and they're not allowed to use the coal or, or, or oil under their, their soil. They're not allowed. Um, no, China, China's not stopping them. They're helping them. So all of that indicates to me that they're controlling the terms and conditions of how climate change and how sustainability are being defined. Russia is too. So is India. Um, and on the other hand, for the co, I don't know if I might put this on, on YouTube later, maybe. So I won't say the word, but under uh, COBIB, 
uh, Kobib uh, response. Um, they also ensured that certain things like, you know, um, hydroxychloroquine um, is massively widely available as a response protocol as it has been since the very start of this thing. Right. They're also very much aware of uh, bio, bio labs that have been deploying all sorts of um, bio agents on cattle, livestock, humans in China, which has been going on since SARS 2003. Mm -hmm. um, same thing for Russia has been experiencing various forms of bio warfare um, for a period. I think by, by virtue of me having said that, this can't go on YouTube. Anyway, um, so they, 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 are, they have many variables to keep into consideration. Namely, the key thing is stability. And number two is survival. And, uh, and not allowing Pfizer to come in with their mRNAs. India has done the same thing. Their Supreme Court just ruled that no governor of any uh, province of India is allowed to force mandates, vax mandates. It seems um, under India has a more has a really still a functional uh, uh, justice system because I the mean, in Austria, Germany, it's all corrupted. I mean, oh, yeah, you, yeah. You, you've been on the Corona Investigative Committee, you know, with uh, Ryan Filmic, and he yeah. he always he always said he has hopes for Austria, but but now I have I've lost all hopes, and you know, I, I studied law and I see the the process, the constitutional court is totally biased and maybe even corrupted or or, or, or extorted or whatever. But but in Germany, it's it's gone. I mean, the justice system is gone. You know, from from the very you know uh, very small courts up to the constitutional courts, it's all super corrupted. Uh, it's, so I mean, I, yeah, I've been very disenchanted. I ha I have seen some. There's some some courts that have exhibited a bit of a fight. Yeah, I don't want individual judges who individual have been, judges. by the way, then you know, uh, even you know, uh, prosecuted and even you know the people. I mean, it's it's mind boggling like, what what they have been, what, what well, doing to the people. Yeah, and I mean, there's still a very important role to play for the court system in the current fight, but it can't just be that. Like, if people are putting their eggs in that basket. Nah. They're setting themselves for some serious disappointment. Yeah. Um, you, you need to have a, a, a fuller spectrum approach to this. Mm -hmm. I don't have all of the answers, but I do know what's lacking, and I do know what's, what type of attributes are necessary. Again, read my books if you want to <laughs> get a sense of, of some of those attributes and some of the battle plan. But certainly the, the Asian court system, especially India, has demonstrated a good quality of fight. In Pakistan, there's a big fight. You know, we saw that there was pressure to bend to the demands of the U.S. State Department to oust mm -hmm. Imran Khan who was a little bit too pro-Russia China. Um, the current government, though, despite that, is still not that bad. Um, they didn't get, like, a George Soros government in there. They just got something that is a little bit uh, less rebellious than Imran Khan was, was being. But they're still on board uh, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt and Road, working with Russia. So it's even that's not such a big defeat. Philippines as well, right? We've seen Philippines demonstrate that despite having Smartmatic, you know, Soros, Mark Malik, Brown's uh, voting, vote rigging operations, um, despite that, the S Soros, Mark Malik, Brown styled uh, operative who was supposed to win did not succeed in the fraudulent, you know, right. which, which should have been um, another, yet another fraudulent election. And in fact, despite that the population turned out in such force and there was such a coordinated effort by even the elites the patriotic elites within Philippines that Ferdinand Marcos's uh, son uh, Junior uh, succeeded, and uh, and it succeeded in a very important way. So there's there's a variety of wins that people have to hold in mind. Um, the current fight in the USA is still a big one. That's a big point of battle even now, mm -hmm. despite the fact that the uh, that there was a coup not that long ago. Um, but the better there are good-hearted, good-minded Republicans currently who are not neocons who are trying their best and I think could still find some interesting wins coming into the, the new elections now unfolding this, this year. Um, so you have to have a, a multi-parameter uh, fight, but you can't do it without a recognition that Eurasia is doing the battle. Like the biggest battle that's happening right now is Eurasia <laughs> on so many levels. And if we try to do our little local thing without harmonizing our strategy with what's actually going on we're wasting a lot of energy and a lot of time and we might even find ourselves thinking that russia or china are the bad guys 
and missing the real agencies of evil, yeah. which is what a lot of people well, who are... But, good- I mean, you know, no wonder. I mean, the, the, the depth and the degree of propaganda, censorship, uh, manipulation, and brainwashing and mass formation, to use the word of Des- uh, Professor Desmond, uh, I, I got to read the book uh, still, um, but I'm, tr- I'm trying to get him on a, on a, on a show. I mean, he's already uh, said yes, but uh, I need to find an appointment with him. Um, hmm. Let me just wrap up with two. I just don't want to take too much time with uh, you, but maybe two final questions. Since I mean, this is a part, you know, Bitcoin podcast focused on Bitcoin, but the more, the more. Also, one thing. last question because I, I I have an interview very. very yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, yeah. Let's do, how, how many? How much time do you have? You have a few minutes. Let's do. Uh, I can do ten more minutes. Okay. Do you want to talk about the fiat system, the uh, the gradual and sudden maybe crash of the fiat system, or Iran uh, enriching the uraniums? You know, after so many years of negotiation, they had this you know, nuclear deal, and then you know they just tore it apart and just, okay. just you know trashed it. Which which topic would you want to just wrap it up? with? Okay, let's let's do uh, let's return back to value to wrap it up. So the the question of fiat versus mm-hmm. uh, non fiat. Um, I think that what was said by Silyuanov, the foreign minister, uh, yeah, uh, finance minister of Russia last week was very funny and very true, where he was responding to um, the US, under US sanctions, there has been a prohibition of Russia to pay their balance of payments and their debts, their debt obligations, um, which is another, another aspect of the economic war against Russia to try to destroy the Russian ruble, which Despite all of their attempts at sanctioning and other things, Russian, the Russian ruble has recovered almost all of the losses. I think all of the losses have been recovered that were, that had begun in February of this year, <laughs> um, because you know, like Russia, China, India, other other markets in Eurasia are m- very happy to That's absorb the losses. Yeah, yeah, they're and and those committing the sanction regimes are are doing greater damage to themselves and to their own people, as we see right now with people who are being told to freeze to, de- to death this coming winter to save Ukrainians um, and uh, and yeah, pay like $8 at the gas pump per gallon. I mean, for, for what? Why? You know, people are already starving. They're not working anymore because of two years of COVID. And now you're telling them to suffer even more. They've, they don't have a lot, a lot more to give. Um, so most people don't really, you know, care so much about the geopolitical narratives. They, they need to feed their family. They need to have a job. They need to have you know, affordable energy, and they're not being given that. They're being told to instead die for the new world order in the West. So Russia currently, um, go, going back to Silyuanov. So he responded when he was asked uh, by a, by somebody, a journalist. Well, what what is your response to this crisis of Russia not being able to pay their their debts because of the the sanctions? And he said, Look, the U.S. dollar, the euro, um, it's candy wrappers. The, it has no value backing it. It's candy wrappers, and the they we are being told to exchange uh, oil commodities re- real uh, reality backed uh, money in exchange for candy wrappers. It's a fraud. It's not a big loss. And he basically said, "Don't worry about it. You're freaking out too much. It's not that big of a threat as you think it is. It's not real money." <laughs> and it's true. Like we we've lost. The money in circulation under the U.S. dollar uh, has completely lost any viability, and trust, especially and trust, huh? after being, you know, frozen. I mean, they started, you know, freezing all kinds of accounts. Whatever. Oh yeah, they froze Venezuela, they froze Iran, they froze Afghanistan. No if the, when the trust is gone, what's yeah. left? You exactly, know? the whole basis of the system is that you have some faith that these 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 pieces of paper that we allow to circulate have some value. If you, people don't have the faith, then you go the way of Weimar Germany, nineteen twenty three. Right where people soon realized, wait a minute, there's more money than there are atoms in the sun. Maybe the money doesn't have value, and people were wiping their butts with you know million dollar Reichsmarks. Um, now, the the solution to that would have been here. So this is where history is useful, right? The solution to the the Weimar Germany 1923 would have been the 1922 Rapallo Accords that were organized in Italy between the Russians and the Germans, especially around uh, Walter Rathenau and uh, Kurt von Schleicher, his assistant. Who had organized a abolition of the Versailles Treaty debt repayments, basically a debt jubilee? Were um, they like part of the Bank of International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks? Uh, the, the yeah, that came jubilee? later. That was set up in 1930 okay. under the the Young Plan. Mm-hmm. That was a J.P. Morgan operation with the yeah. Bank of England. Uh, but that was that was eight years later. But in 1922, the um, the 
the, the German patriots were followers of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick List around the, uh, the figure of, of Kurt von Schleicher, who later became chancellor. He, he was assassinated by Hitler. And, and his uh, boss, who was uh, Walter Rathenau, they were, mem- they were leaders of the Frederick List Society, the Frederick List Movement, which was, again, modeled on the U.S. Hamiltonian Lincoln system of protectionism, long-term state credit, internal improvements. So the idea of that List system that they were promoting with the Russians, um, the better Russians, because you had good and bad Russians fighting for control at the time, right? The Bolshevik Re- Revolution had just happened, and it was a mixed bag. Um but what they had negotiated successfully was one, an abolition of the, the unpayable debts. So you don't have to print money to pay unpayable debts. Number two, um, a mutual infrastructure investment program with Russia and Germany, both mutually cooperating on helping the other industrially develop through investments into R&D, um, the advanced sector um, um, infrastructure. And that would have created the, it would have increased the purchasing power of the Reichsmarks, of the Rupels in circulation, because you're increasing the real world value, right? That's how to increase the purchasing power of paper. The reason why people have faith in the paper is because they can see that the real world that they live in is generating real creative wealth and yeah. their lives are improving. And so I have faith that this paper has value and, you know, and I could well, buy more with less paper over time, which is why even yeah. though people were, you know, um, earning quantitatively less in the 1970s when we still had an industrially productive powerful society compared to today that one that lower income per cap like nominally like quantitatively was still able to support with one one work like one man working an average job as a blue collar worker was still able to support a family of three four five kids you know uh one paycheck with like vacation money with a car, having a house, because like it was things that today are right? un- goods and services produce. I mean, right? Yeah, you were producing something real, and today that's unimaginable. You can't have that. You know, you have to have at least two parents working, uh, at least two, you know, two jobs, sometimes three or four. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, on top to of get that, you have now the 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 unimaginable, you know, uh, central bank's balance sheet, you know, yeah. of just printing so, whatever digital. Yeah, it's, it's money. monopoly money. It's candy yeah. wrappers today. Whereas, so Russia and China increasingly have their values of the the money in circulation, whether digital or whether physical, whatever. It's premised around real commodities, right? Oil, wheat, uh, industrial goods production. There's real indices of value. So you could say kind of it has a quality of fiat, but it's not really like because, yeah, you, you can produce um, credit within the, the central banking system of China. But the credit is behaving in a way which, one, has some association with the real world that is real. Number two is behave, is investing itself is tied to the real economy. So like 90 percent of the new currency in circulation in China, as Sergei, Sergei Glaziev pointed out beautifully, goes towards the the real economy it, mm-hmm. it it increases the overall free energy of the system whereas in the same uh the same new new uh currencies created in the western system something like one out of five dollars has any connection even a little bit to the real economy most of it just goes back into inflating the bubble so it's it's totally devoid of reality it's, it's hyperinflationary so one type of debt is anti-inflationary because the purchasing power of the the credit in circulation increases. And the other type, it is very inflationary because you're just creating more money, but you're creating no real value. So candy wrapper. And that's where I would say on a principled level, I'm not going to get into the details of crypto and other things. I'm not going to do that, but I'm just saying (laughs) a Bitcoin. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but the, the most important thing for anybody to have in mind, I think, on a principled level of the science of value and science economy is that whatever type of mechanism that people put online, as far as the type of currency, digital, Bitcoin, other, um, it has to be obedient to that reality. To the degree that they are not aware of that, it will blow up in their face, you know? So we have to have those those real scientific metrics. Yeah, and that's why we need Bitcoin, uh, Matthew, because it's incorruptible. 
it's there's only 21 million and it's you know you know all the properties of bitcoin you know it's uncensorable unconfiscatable it's truly distributed and decentralized so this is you know it's only mathing uh, there's just no rulers just rules you know and i think this is uh, the time has come we need something that is just you know neutral math code and incorruptible well look for me i'm i'm a fan of of being aware of our strengths and weaknesses. And I want to not, I tend to avoid using the absolute language of incorruptible. For me, that's an absolute word because I think everything created by man is corruptible in a sense. Because we, we, we are corruptible. It's distributed and it's decentralized. We, well, look, we're creatures of wisdom and folly. So to the mm -hmm. degree that we allow foolish wrong ideas to govern our society, anything we create will can be used foolishly mm -hmm. to the detriment of our children. Anytime we have wisdom as good ideas governing our society, any tool we create will be used for the good in various degrees. And so I, I would put Bitcoin in that mix of created tools as I would a hammer or any other good thing that could also be governed by folly. Um, that I just, because I think that if we are too, arrogance always kills us. And, and lack of humility always gets us to yeah, misstep. Yeah, definitely. No, I'm, I'm totally so, with you. Yeah, we need, we always need to be conscious and aware of our, you know, preserving our like, I can come up with scenarios where somebody goes and does something super dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and within that system, the, the Bitcoin in circulation, like, could be falsely divided up maybe infinitely to the point that it's so diffused and not not attached to real real production that could happen yeah, yeah. but but you know the thing is about like it's the, the use case the, you know, the proof is in the pudding you know i mean people are using it when, you, when we talk about like you know whatever not like western countries but countries where it's like inflationary hyperinflationary where people are being incarcerated because they're going to the street i mean especially you know more and more truckers all these people they're coming out and saying you know if it wasn't for bitcoin <laughs> They, yeah, yeah, no, I know, and Bitcoin no, has, has helped me I'm quite a bit saying, too. Don't get me wrong, I got my. They're I, using it. People are using it. You yeah, know, yeah. Like store a value meter exchange. You I hear account. you. I hear it's, you. I, I and I use. I have a you. wallet. I have a wallet. I encourage it. It's it's helped me out too. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, going into battle, it's important to be aware of right. weaknesses and strengths. And like infinite has two directions. Like there's infinite of more and infinite divisible. So it's like the Zeno's paradox. You know, like technically by Zeno's paradox, you should be able to go from here to here because you're always like going by halves mm -hmm. forever. And thus in that mathematical logic, you should never be able to get from point A to point B because uh, there's infinite halvings as well as you could always add infinitely from the outside. So the fact that, you know, it, yes, okay. There's a limited amount of Bitcoin available. You could always have you, like in, in our current fiat system, you could always infin infinitely have more money. That's bad. But I think that the inversion of it, that infinite expression in subdivisions is also can walk you into an inflationary chamber if you're not doing it well. The infinite is a bad infinite, a bad infinite in either direction could cause you to uh, see something bad happen as far as inflation is concerned. If you're not aware of the physical boundary conditions of the real world that we live in with the 8 billion people in a physical world, in a universe that's creative, you know, if you don't have those real parameters first and foremost in your mind, you can misstep along the way. Yeah, but because you you know you're talking you 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 talked a lot about purchasing power and that's what I'm saying you know once we have this deflationary money and that is Bitcoin you know the, this uh, then you need less and less for more and more and better and better you know products and services and uh, and, and technology so um, I think th this is this is you know a very uh, a topic very dear to my heart you know that's uh, yeah but it needs a really uh, I think a, a special session uh, maybe in the future sure. which, which yeah, I okay. would love to you know to catch up with you soon hopefully <laughs> okay all right man oh, it's always a pleasure I, but, I really love talking, talking to you man um, yeah, let me let, let me know your let me know where where people can find you I mean besides your, your that volume three book which I'm gonna put explicitly as a link but uh, where else on LinkedIn uh, Twitter uh, uh, website. Oh. I'm trying to grow my Telegram channel. So um, if people want to try the T, it's t.me backslash uh -huh. Canadian Patriot Press. Yeah. Um, that. That, that's always being updated. And the other thing is uh, CanadianPatriot.org is my, my main website. Also with my wife, uh, we co-manage the Rising Tide, RisingTideFoundation.net is another more cultural website that people can check out. And if they want to participate in... Uh, the weekly lectures and, and workshops that we host 
usually twice a week. Uh, they could send us an email at info at risingtidefoundation.net if they want also a free copy of the book. I know some people can't afford to pay for the book. It's preferable that you buy it, but if you can't, don't worry about it. The economy kicked a lot of people's butts. I understand. It's worth it. uh, yeah. yeah, you could send us an email at the info at risingtidefoundation.net, send you a free copy of the PDF. And uh, yeah, I think it's, that'll keep you busy for a while. Yeah. I guess so. So, <laughs> hey, man, uh, good luck with your next interview. And hopefully, yeah, I'll get, let's stay in touch. Yeah, man. Okay. All right. Ciao. Bye. Bye. All right. Um, I just want to, in closing, um, I want to say, uh, Matthew, I love, you know, talking to, I love the knowledge, comprehension, and the wisdom of, of Matthew Eret. Uh, just uh, when it comes to, you know, to uh, money and Bitcoin and uh, economics and awesome economics, um, maybe he, ha you know, Matthew has a little bit different approach and different, you know, thought patterns. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I think it needs, it deserves uh, a special session, a special, you know, seance, <laughs> what do we call it, a special discussion with uh with matthew maybe some other uh you know more or less prominent bitcoiner who is really deep into that i would love to have like a deep talk uh, uh with a with a canadian uh, with another canadian jeff Booth, one of my favorite bitcoiners and and authors you know uh, the price of tomorrow why deflation is the key to an abundant future uh but you know check out matthew average on uh twitter linkedin on his website i'm going to put all the links under in the show notes and Bitcoin fixes this. Uh, accumulate as much as possible. Get yourself a hardware wallet. Get yourself a mobile wallet. Start with something. Uh, get get your if you are on exchange, which you should not uh, in the long term. Just get it off the exchange and transfer it to a hardware wallet. And be an individual sovereign and uh, you know be in control of your own destiny, of your own money, and of your own future for yourself and for your children. All right, that's about it. Thank you so much. I'm the host of the Kevin Devani Connection Show, and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye.